the Royal Palace of Holyrood House, Edinburgh. Every year, the Queen spends a week in official residence here and holds a garden party for 8,000 guests in the grounds. Whilst in Scotland, her guard of honour is provided by the Royal Company of Archers, amateur soldiers drawn from the Scottish gentry. The Queen's presence in Scotland is a very significant part of her role, for the Queen is the head of a united kingdom of diverse nations, each with their own culture. The monarchy, in many ways, has been the cement that binds the Union together. I think there's been a problem in Britain about creating a national British identity, given the power of English national identity, and that the monarchy has played a crucial role in maintaining the Union by presenting itself as a mirror in which the other parts of the United Kingdom can see themselves reflected. So that even although they may feel alienated from the British state, the English state as a state, they can feel themselves committed and loyal to the monarch, who is not an English monarch, but is a reflection of their local identity. It's not simply that the, the monarchy helps the Union. The Union also helps the monarchy. It's a stronger monarchy, a more important one. It is perceived overseas as more significant because of the strongly welded structure of the United Kingdom. And I think this is particularly true in the 1990s when in the rest of Europe, uh, national identity crises are the norm rather than something unusual. This role in welding the Union together has never been clearer than in the investiture of the Prince of Wales in 1969 at a time of growing Welsh nationalism. The first English Prince of Wales was created by Edward I in 1301 after a violent conquest. In 1969, the approach was more subtle. Before his investiture, Prince Charles spent a term at the University of Wales in Aberystwyth. Edward Millward taught him Welsh. He believes the prince fully understood the underlying purpose of the investiture. I'm sure that he knew that the impetus for his visit to Aberystwyth and for the investiture came from the political establishment in London in an effort to slow down the growth, if not to stop the growth of, uh, of Welsh nationalism, and to strengthen the hold of the monarchy and uh, to strengthen the union um, uh, as between Wales and England as well. I think he had a very strong sentimental hold on the Welsh people, and the monarchy itself, it seems to me, has a sentimental hold on the Welsh people, and but a very sentimental people. And the investiture itself was a good piece of theatre, wasn't it? It was a good piece of constitutional theatre, and that went down rather well. So I suppose his stay in Aberystwyth, the fact that he was making commitment towards the language, and then the investiture, uh, increase the emotional hold on the Welsh people. Yet while Prince Charles may be Prince of Wales and still wear the Welsh leek on his lapel, in the north of his kingdom, he and his family take on a different guise. In Scotland, the monarchy demonstrates its Scottishness by its dedication to that badge of Highland identity, the kilt. In so doing, they are following a tradition established only at the beginning of the last century, as a way of controlling the rebellious Scots. In 1822, at a time of great political turmoil, the basically German King George IV was persuaded to visit Scotland. There hadn't been a, a monarch visiting Scotland since 6, 1651, and the years up to 1820 were years of political strikes, uh, industrialization, urbanization, it was a very nervous establishment. Uh, there had been what the government said was an insurrection in 1820 called the Radical War at the time. So what the government needed to do was to give some alternative identity, uh, to give some other focus of loyalty, which really didn't exist. The king became that focus, not least because he agreed to wear a kilt, the dress of the rebellious Highlanders. What we have to do is to envisage George IV. He weighs 20 or 22 stone. Uh, so this is a very, very large kilt he has round him. But it's in the Royal Stuart Tartan, which is very surprising, because after all, he is the grand nephew of Cumberland, Butcher Cumberland, 
who had butchered the Highland troops at Culloden in 1746. Underneath it all, he's got a pair of flesh-colored tights, perhaps the largest tight Scotland had ever seen up to this point. And it was truly a sensation. Edinburgh probably was uh, a city with about 100,000 people at the time. It was estimated 300,000 came to see this 21-day uh, visit. He gave permission to Walter Scott to dig out the Scottish crown jewels, the honours of Scotland, from their hiding place in Edinburgh Castle, and they were duly presented to him during his visit. It was an affirmation of the Scottishness as well as the Britishness of the monarchy, and it set a pattern which was followed by Queen Victoria and all subsequent monarchs. It was Victoria and Albert who consolidated the royal relationship with Scotland, buying Balmoral and making it into a royal family home. They embrace this Highland culture with all the enthusiasm of new converts. They decked out Balmoral, each room in it, uh, usually uh, red Stuart tartan on the floor, uh, hunting tartan on the walls and the curtains, uh, a whiter dress Stuart tartan for curtains. Uh, Lord Rosebery, one of those politicians who had to go the whole way up to Deeside, 600 miles by train, complained that the drawing room there was the ugliest room in the world. Every wall, every surface was decked out in tartan, designed by the Queen and Albert. It is argued that, in fact, the monarchy helps to disguise the unequal relationships between the partners in the Union. By providing a Scottish version of the monarch as head of state, Scotland's role within the Union is maintained as that of an equal partner rather than a subservient state. No matter how subservient the economics or the politics are, because the state is reflected in the monarch, then it is equal at that highest level of the state. And so what I think it's produced is an unrebellious identity within the Union, and that monarchy has been crucial to maintaining that status quo of the relationship of Scotland to the Union throughout the past 200 years. But there have been moments when the monarchy has failed to keep up the appearance of treating Scotland equally. After her coronation in 1953, the Queen journeyed north to receive the honours of Scotland in a ceremony at St Giles Cathedral. For quite a while before we heard the cheering as, as her carriage came nearer and nearer, and then, you see, she came to the door and they, they heard the horses settling down and presumably she was getting out of her coach and, and then the door flung open and in she came. And that, was, as far as I was concerned, was an anticlimax. I was <laughs> in my Sunday best. I was in as good trick trim as she was. <laughs> it was very disappointing. And this was the Queen making her first visit to Scotland. And she came to this special service in St Giles and we expected her to come in her, rightly or wrongly, we, I expected her to come in her coronation robes. And I was shocked when she appeared in this simple, I don't know, a bluey, grey blue coat. And she looked so ordinary. I, I still think that she might have honoured the occasion as well as we did. The ancient crown of Scotland. To many people, the most jarring note was struck by the fact that the Queen was carrying a handbag. The Duke of Hamilton and Brandon, as holder of the Earldom of Angus, receives the crown from the Queen. The Duke is reputed to have said, now this is only hearsay, that when he went down, knelt down to hand her the honours of Scotland on a salver or whatever it was, her handbag swung out and nearly hit him but on the face. So that, that, that was the story that went round. It was a good story. And I, I think it was probably true. <laughs> In the official painting commemorating the ceremony, the handbag is conspicuous by its absence. Her Majesty the Queen has further endeared herself to all her Scottish subjects. The irritation over this incident reflected a wider feeling that the monarchy basically saw itself as English, 
and it wasn't the first time such a thing had happened in the Queen's short reign. Nobody paused to think that there never had been an Elizabeth I in Scotland, and therefore to have an Elizabeth II was historical nonsense. Save the Queen! It seemed insensitive towards Scottish history, and it seemed completely to ignore the fact that the two kingdoms were not only equal partners, but that in 1603, a Scottish Stuart king had traveled south to take over his English inheritance. It wasn't that England had conquered Scotland, but this seemed to be treating it like a colony. Many people felt upset and hypersensitive about that. As a result, post boxes bearing the new royal inscription, E2R, were attacked. The symbolic blowing up of pillar boxes, uh, which had ER2 on them, was a way of Scots insisting that not that they were against the monarchy, but that the monarchy ought to properly represent their Scottishness within the Union, rather than identifying itself as an English institution. And today, the E2R inscription is tactfully omitted from post boxes and Royal Mail vans in Scotland. And the royal family is now much more conscious of the need to present itself as Scottish. Kinlock Anderson are the principal kilt makers to the royal family. These are the tartans here which are applicable to the royal family as at the present time. This is the tartan which Prince Andrew wears as the Duke of Inverness. Um, Navy was put into it to bring out their association with the, the, the Royal Navy. So that is why that is Navy in that one. A lot of people think that Prince Charles is Prince of Wales, who is also in Scotland, he's also the Lord of the Isles. And as such, he wears the Lord of the Isles tartan in the special dyes that was created for him. So that is the, the Lord of the Isles tartan. And it's one of his favorites. And of course, we come back to the most exclusive tartan. This is the Royal Tartan, the Balmoral Tartan. This is the most exclusive tartan. It was designed by Prince Albert for Queen Victoria uh, in 1853. It de depicts the granite hills of Aberdeenshire. And even to this day, it's only the sovereign that can give permission for this to be worn. But while the royal family has been largely successful in pulling off the trick of presenting itself as a focus of the union in Wales and Scotland, there is one part of the kingdom where the position of the monarchy is intensely controversial. Northern Ireland. The British monarchy is Protestant by law, and in Northern Ireland this means something very serious. The monarchy is vitally important to the Protestants of Northern Ireland because they have a historic right and claim to the monarchy in two regards. First of all, they are British folk, and uh, uh, the royal line came through Ulster historically and in the ancient past. And secondly, uh, it's the monarchy they fought for to establish a Protestant throne in Britain. A monarch, King William III, William of Orange, established the Protestant ascendancy once and for all, and he has become one of its most important symbols. And the present queen, still has a central position in the rituals of the Protestant Orange Order. When you take your vows to become an Orange Man as part of the principles of becoming an Orange Man that you respect and show loyalty to the, the Queen and Constitution as far as the Queen is concerned. Also, uh, at the beginning of our meeting and as part of our ritual, we always say, God bless the Queen, and we say prayers for the Queen and the members of the royal family. At the conclusion of all of our meetings, or any sermons of any kind at all, we always sing the national anthem, which is God Save the Queen. This, it's argued, narrows the monarchy's appeal in the province. The problem for the monarchy has been is that it has, if you like, been commandeered by one side. It has been appropriated by the Protestant side, the Loyalist side. And the more extreme people on the Loyalist side have used the monarchy as a symbol uh, against the Catholics. So what has happened is that the monarchy here isn't seen as a straight and neutral thing. It is seen by many Catholics as an anti-Catholic institution. In practice, in Northern Ireland, it actually divides people rather than unites people. In fact, a very close relative of mine working in the shipyard, uh, he had uh, a picture of the royal family put on his locker. Um, it wasn't put there uh, to, as it were, um, 
give him some sort of uh, uplift. It was put there in order to assert uh, the fact that he was a Catholic and that he should be subjugated uh, to the crown and subjugated to uh, unionist uh, authority and to the unionist political culture. However, in 1985, it's believed the monarchy played an important role in defusing Protestant anger at the Anglo-Irish agreement. That you are negotiating the affairs and future of Northern Ireland with a foreign government. When Protestant protests against the agreement failed to have any effect, Unionist politicians launched a petition. The time had come we had to appeal to the Queen, and that we did. And we delivered uh, many hundreds of thousands of signatures, I think it was over 500,000 if my memory serves me well, uh, to Buckingham Palace. And the world saw that here was a people who hadn't lost faith in the Queen, certainly lost faith in uh, the Queen's ministers, but not in the Queen herself. And you know, if we hadn't had that cement at that time, Ulster could have gone into a civil war uh, the like of which Ireland had never witnessed before. But there was something held us together, and that was the fact that we had appeal to the Queen. Others take the view that British politicians use this devotion to the monarchy to keep the Protestant community in check. It certainly seems to be the case that ministers regard royalty as a, as a, as a weapon, if you like, in their armory. For example, when the Anglo-Irish Agreement was signed back in 1985, Protestants felt very uh, harassed, Protestants felt very worried about their British identity, and they thought that sovereignty was being eroded. As one of the arguments uh, to counter that, what happened was that we suddenly had a great flood of royals visiting Northern Ireland every couple of months. And the message there was clear from that. It was to say, your sovereignty isn't threatened, and here we are showing you the royals to make this point and to try and reassure unionists that everything was all right. And there is little doubt that the Queen herself does believe that the kingdom should remain united. She made her views on this unusually plain in a speech in 1977 in response to a rising tide of nationalism in Scotland and in Wales. I can readily understand these aspirations. But I cannot forget that I was crowned Queen of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. The United Kingdom has remained intact, but in recent years there's been a resurgence of nationalism. In the last election, almost three quarters of Scots voted for some kind of political autonomy. And this desire for some sort of independence might appear to exclude the monarchy. While the official national anthem may be God Save the Queen, it has been replaced in Wales with Land of My Fathers. And more recently in Scotland, by Flower of Scotland. I think the important thing about Flower of Scotland is that it was the song which focused a renaissance Scottish nationalism in the 70s and 80s. And it was a nationalism which was, in its undercurrent, aggressively anti-English and was recollecting wars between the two countries and focused this in terms of the defeat of the English monarch. Princess Anne caused some surprise when, as patron of the Scottish Rugby Football Union, she was seen happily singing along with this. And now, ironically, we have members of the royal family arriving in Scotland to sing this song and therefore, in a sense, to assert the requirement that they themselves be sent back home. But by singing the song, they actually make it safe and make it safe for monarchy to participate in this and make that kind of Scottishness safe within the British Union again. I think it was an astute thing to do, I think it was a popular thing to do, and perhaps it suggests that they are already thinking about the ways in which they have to adjust their image and their identification in the light of changes likely to take place. Opinion polls suggest that almost half of all Scots want to be rid of the monarchy, 
But even Scotland's most radical party, the Scottish Nationalists, plan to retain the Queen if ever they achieve their aim of full independence. However, the sovereign's role in Scotland would be reformed. What we're trying to do is to, not to separate Scotland socially from England. What we're trying to do is have political independence so we're not governed by remote control from London. And as a sort of symbol of the, the social union and the, and the shared and common history, I think the monarchy has a place in an independent Scotland. But I think the vestiges, the remaining political role of the monarchy should go, and we should have a modern constitutional monarchy where a symbolic and a very, very important role as the head of state is fulfilled, but not that the political role, which I think is highly questionable in some areas. And even those who simply propose a devolved Scottish Parliament foresee the end of a political role for the Queen north of the border. Although the monarch would be invited to open the parliament, she would not have the kind of role that she plays vis-a-vis -vis Westminster. Uh, it would be a fixed-term parliament, so she would not have the power to dissolve the parliament. It, uh, there would be no question of a Queen's speech. There would be a State of the Nation address by the Prime Minister, nor would be, there be the, the weekly uh, uh, consultations with the Prime Minister. Uh, all of these things, I think, would not be relevant in the Scottish context. It is left with a purely decorative role. And unless the monarchy decides that it will develop a different kind of role, I think it will be difficult to adjust to a situation where you have a weakened British state. It is the rise of Europe that is giving countries like Scotland the feeling that they can break away from the old union in favour of a wider one. And it is not only the weakening of the union which threatens to diminish the nation and the sovereign that embodies it, it is also possible that the shift of power to Europe could have a similar effect. In May, the Queen visited the European Parliament in Strasbourg for the first time. For many years, Mrs Thatcher, fearful of a loss of sovereignty, had refused to allow such visits to take place. In the event, the Queen appeared to be enthusiastically European. ..against the background of the proven commitment of Europeans today to reconciliation and democracy. One of the more intriguing factors is that the monarchy is one of the most European institutions we have. The European monarchies are very much intermarried and therefore our own royal family has Dutch blood, German blood, uh, Danish blood, Greek blood. I think it's important to recognise that Europe itself as an institution is not trying to threaten the monarchy. It isn't saying you cannot have a monarchy. It will inevitably change its role but I suspect the monarchy recognises this and indeed will play a part in smoothing that transition process. Plus de 20 ans sont passés et aujourd'hui que le Royaume-Uni est But Eurosceptics regret royal enthusiasm for Europe. I must say I was surprised at what appeared to be the Queen's enthusiasm for the EEC. I would find it very strange to find a British Queen, the head of a nation, appearing to be enthusiastic about something which will make the nation and perhaps herself rather irrelevant. I think it's not a question of choice, it's a question of fact. If you have a real nation with real power and real authority, you need to have a presentational head that might be a queen or might be a president, but if the nation fades away, then the purpose of the monarchy simply fades away too. Lord of honour, the monarch's chief purpose is to act the part of non-political head of state. But how can she stand as a figurehead above the party fray? And is her constitutional role simply fading away? Next week, we examine the impact of the monarchy on the political life of the country.